Therefore all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the gentle earth with greenness, or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple tree, or the night thatch smokes in the sun thaw. Whether the eave drops fall, heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. These are the last lines of Coleridge's poem, Frost at Midnight. It's a poem very special to me. I read it to my newborn daughter only hours after she had been in this world. The reading was apt since Coleridge in Frost at Midnight is writing to his infant son, Hartley. In the poem, we imagine the poet sitting late at night in his cottage, snow is outside on the ground, he sees his infant son lying beside him sleeping, and he starts to imagine his own childhood, which was rather painful and lonely and urban. And he wants, he says, his son's childhood to be quite different than his. He wants his child to be a child of nature, to grow up and enjoy the unity um, of all things in the natural world. And so the poem ends with this lovely blessing uh, where the poet asks the natural world, the mysterious ice of the natural world, to welcome and bless his son. This is an example of a sort of poem that Coleridge made famous, and some would say he even created it, and this is known as the Conversation Poem. The first example of this is his 1795 poem, Aeolian Harp, where he imagines himself lying on a cot with his new wife, um, Sarah. And the last example of this would be uh, most likely Coleridge's 1802 Dejection and Ode. And in between, um, we find two famous conversation poems, This Lime Tree Bower My Prison and The Nightingale. What is a conversation poem? In the poem, uh, we have a speaker who imagines an interlocutor. The interlocutor can be present, uh, which is usually the case, but sometimes can be distant, as in This Lime Tree Bower My Prison, or dejection and ode. And the poem has a casual feeling, like an actual conversation would have a casual feeling. Often, often Coleridge will begin a poem by saying, well, as you might start a casual conversation with a friend. And the poem ensues in a very casual kind of blank verse. So this is the first thing to note about the conversation poem. Unlike most poetry of the time in the 1790s, early 1800s, uh, Coleridge writes in a very loose conversational style that approaches how people really speak in the world, as opposed to a more ornate, um, artificial poetic style that one might have seen in the 18th century, or yes. The second part of the conversation poem to note is that it's always based on a tension between Isolation and communion. Isolation and communion. Uh, the poem usually begins with the speaker um, alone uh, or feeling alone and talking about what it feels like to be alone and expressing a desire not to be alone anymore. And in, in expressing that desire, the poet imagines uh, someone listening and in the course of talking through his own isolation, he feels connected with the person he's talking to and will overcome, in most cases, the isolation and conclude the poem with communion. So those are two other obvious um, elements of the Coleridge conversation poem. But there's a third element which is more complicated, and that is this, that although the poet imagines an interlocutor, we never actually hear the interlocutor speak. Um, and as I said, in some cases, the interlocutor is not even there. So the conversation is ironic. Uh, the poet is talking to someone who is not able to talk back, which isn't a conversation at all. It's a monologue. It's a monologue with somebody listening. Now, this is apt for Coleridge. Coleridge was the most famous conversationalist of his age. People would actually travel for miles to hear him talk. He was so erudite, so lyrical, um, and so loquacious. He could talk about anything with, with, with great rhetorical skill. But he would go on and on and on and on and on, and he simply would not listen to anyone else respond. So the poems that seem to be based on a desire for communion, in fact, I would say 
really solidify the isolation. Um, because if you're talking only to hear yourself talk, you can't even hear anyone else trying to talk to you. Now, an example of, of, of this ironic conversation poem um, is most marked in this Lime Tree Bower My Prison. Uh, the poet um, wrote this poem in another story um, in 1797. Uh, the, the, the story goes that his wife Sarah had accidentally spilled hot milk on his foot so he could not go out walking over the Quantox, which was his normal habit. Wordsworth and Dorothy, um, William Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth were visiting, so missing out on a walk would be especially painful. Also visiting was Charles Lamb, who um, not even a year earlier had witnessed his sister murder their mother and had fallen into a deep depression in London. So Coleridge invited him up to find some healing in the natural world. So Charles Lamb, Dorothy and William Wordsworth go for this hike out in the Quantocks while Coleridge spends his time in a lime tree bower owned by his neighbor, um, Tom Poole. And he laments his loneliness, but then he starts imagining where the three hikers are going. And as he does, he moves out of himself and he focuses on Charles because he imagines that in some ways he and Charles have had similar experiences of isolation. Um, and he calls Charles gentle-hearted Charles more than once. And eventually he imagines himself standing right where gentle-hearted Charles stands, seeing what he sees. And this gives him a feeling of connection with his, his childhood friend. They went to Christ um, Hospital together. But the irony is that, first of all, Charles Lamb was not necessarily gentle-hearted. Certainly he was a kind man, but also he was acerbic, sarcastic. Um, he was an alcoholic. Uh, he struggled deeply with depression. And he hated the fact that Coleridge called him gentle-hearted Charles in that poem. So Coleridge is not even paying attention to his interlocutor at all. He's misnaming his interlocutor, perhaps imposing upon to Charles a trait that he wishes he had himself. So we have a casual conversation, a casual link verse in the Coleridgean conversation poem. We have the tension between isolation and communion. And I would say the more problematic part of the conversation poem as it is manifest in Coleridge is that the communion is ironic um, because we really don't have a full presence of another there speaking with agency that the poet can connect to. And this could well have grown out of Clarice's own habit of over-talking and perhaps um, suffering the consequences because of that, of feeling alone.